Our guest this weekend is in studio with me. He's Judge John Denson, a great war historian and a lawyer who helped Lou Rockwell found the Mises Institute right here in Auburn in the early 1980s. So in celebration of Christmas, Judge Denson and I discussed the infamous World War I truce that took place between British and German troops now just more than 100 years ago in December of 1914, and also how the 20th century may have been radically different and radically less bloody if that truce had brought about an early end to the war. John and I also discussed the critical importance of historical revisionism and why a more peaceful future really depends on all of us questioning official history and state propaganda. So on this Christmas weekend, stay tuned for a great interview and a hopeful message with Judge John Denson. Well, John Denson, welcome to Mises Weekends, and thanks so much for being here today. Glad to be here. Thanks Merry for Christmas me. to Merry you. Merry Christmas to you. And Merry Christmas to our audience. It is Christmas weekend. So today we're talking about the now infamous Christmas truce, which is more than 100 years ago in 1914, December, fall of 1914 in France. You know, John, there are varying accounts of what happened. It depends on who you read. And it, you can't really say who you ask because none of the participants are alive today or very few. Um how widespread do you think it really was? And, and do we make more of the Christmas truce than we ought to because it's so hopeful? In other words, it's something we want to believe in. Well, I, I, do, I do recognize that there are various accounts of it. Uh, and one reason I like the book uh, Silent Night by Stanley Wintrom, I think he goes to original sources. It's all from a British uh, viewpoint because he went back to uh, – Letters home to the from the front to home to their mothers and fathers by soldiers who were actually there, hmm. and diaries of eyewitnesses. Uh, there's a there's a movie, uh, French movie, uh, called Joyeux Noël, uh, Joyous Noël, that's uh, from a French viewpoint, and uh, I doubt his sources are as good because uh, in Weintraub, who is a very well respected. Uh, Historian, He is the uh, emeritus uh, professor of arts and humanities at Penn State. He's uh, written a lot of military history, and he goes to original sources. And he says that the French and the, and the Belgians were not as prone toward the truce as the English were. They were fighting this war on the French soil and Belgian soil, and, and the British just came across the channel. So uh, I think it was a different viewpoint. So you get different perspectives depending on who's— uh, Who's telling this story? But I, I think this uh, book, Silent Night by Stanley Wintrom, came out in uh, 2001 is a very accurate source from what I can tell. Well, you mentioned that the that the German and British soldiers saw the war a little differently. It was not being fought in their homeland. It was not they, they weren't French. But that's something that's so significant to me, as you you mentioned in your article, uh, from which we excerpted uh, our Mises Daily yesterday, that you say the the British and French soldiers, however, saw a little meaning in the war as to them, after all. The British king and the German Kaiser were both grandsons of Queen Victoria. So this is such an astonishing fact that, that we, the threat that would be posed to the establishment, to the generals, to the politicians by having uh, rank and file soldiers sort of awaken to the idea uh, of the preposterousness of the war. And, and Weintraub also states uh, that I include in my review that you're going to publish is that about 80,000 Germans uh, went to England before World War I to get jobs as cab drivers, uh, uh, working in uh, restaurants as cooks and waiters and so forth. And they uh, had uh, well understood the English language so that there was no uh, uh, language barrier between a lot of them because they spoke very good English. So when they uh, had the truce and began to play football on Christmas Day and sing, they were singing the songs in English and uh, and reciting the um, 23rd Psalm in English. And uh, so there was easy communication. And with all this commonality, why are we fighting might be yeah. the question, right? Exactly. Well, let me ask you this. Obviously, at the time, we could understand why uh, the brass would want to tamp this down and to stop this from spreading. But do you sense that even today, all these many years later, that there is a, an effort to sort of suppress uh, the importance of the Christmas truce and what it meant? Do you think even today, like this sort of war-hungry neoconservative types don't want the Christmas truce to be widely discussed? I think that's true. And uh, I think that was exactly what they tried to do at the time of the uh, the truce. There was a an actual order issued by on Christmas Eve 
by Brigadier General Forrester Walker, and he said to uh, forbid any fraternization. He said, for it discourages initiative in commanders and destroys offensive spirit in all ranks. Friendly intercourse with the enemy, unofficial armistice and exchange of tobacco and other com comforts, however tempting and occasionally amusing they may be, are absolutely prohibited. And then he went on to threaten court-martial of any, any, uh, anybody that fraternized, and they just did it anyway. And the officers couldn't stop it. And then the officers participated. <laughs> so it, uh, you, you don't want to develop good, good feelings in uh, the Christian spirit uh, during wartime. One thing that's so remarkable about the Christmas truce is this whole question of what might have happened if the truce had spread and this had caused the war to uh, end earlier or be somehow limited. And Weintraub addresses this in his book. You know, we may not have had uh, the rise of the of communism, the Russian Revolution, and 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 Stalin and Lenin. Uh, we certainly would not have had Versailles. Uh, as a result, we might not have had Hitler or Nazism or maybe even FDR. I mean, it's remarkable to think about, isn't it? That's right, and, and uh, that's counterfactual history at its best. Uh, Weintraub, uh, that's his last chapter entitled What If? And uh, he points out uh, that um, there would not, he, he thinks there would not have been a, would, well, of course, it's just speculation, counterfactual history, but there would be no uh, Russian Revolution, we wouldn't have gotten to that point uh, where the uh, uh, communism took over, no Lenin, no Stalin. Uh, there was no treaty, it would be no Treaty of Versailles that, um, uh, mistreated Germany, therefore uh, Hitler would not have had his cause to rise, um, and uh, no Hitler, no Nazism, and, and probably no World War II, because if I have argued in the past is that uh, World War II was simply a continuation of World War I with a truce, and uh, World War I was to see if you could remake the world to the benefit of the English, the British, and the Russian Tsar, and uh, that World War II was to see if you could keep it that way, what they'd done in World War I. So. It would have changed the whole history, in my opinion, of the 20th century. And we are still in the Middle East suffering the uh, results of the uh, treaties that uh, ended World War I. I mean, the, the treaties uh, created Iraq, uh, tried to uh, <laughs> uh, gave the, the Syria to the French, and, uh, uh, and uh, Israel was created in the middle of an Arab world, and uh, it it, it's still going. It's still a problem uh, that, that was created by the World War I treaties. So all of that, the whole 20th century, I think, would have been completely different if it could have ended, say, with a truce or a stop at the Christmas of, of 1914. It's amazing to think about that. Well, you mentioned counterfactual history. Let me ask you, how did you as a practicing lawyer, later a judge here in Alabama, become interested in historical revisionism and begin to study the history of war? Well, uh, I, I started out uh, uh, with really no particular interest in, uh, in war. I do remember being in high school and, and uh, thinking about being in the Korean War in the 50s, and I was uh, surprised to hear uh, Senator Robert Taft, when he was running for the Republican nomination, say it was an unconstitutional war. And I thought to myself, uh, you know, am I going? I'm, I'm going to have to fight in this war, and it violates the Constitution. But I sort of that all died out, and, and it wasn't until I, I got to graduate law school in NYU, and I heard uh, Kenneth Galbraith, John Kenneth Galbraith, give a speech to the student body there, and it was during the Kennedy Nixon campaign and debates and so forth. And I got really interested in all of that in 1960, and he made a statement that, um, uh, you know, there are still Neanderthals that believe that you should have a balanced budget. And everybody laughed. And I thought, whoa, wait a minute, I must be a Neanderthal. <laughs> <laughs> so your time at NYU did not turn you into a Galbraithian. No. And uh, an odd thing occurred. I had a lot of relatives there, two from Alabama practicing law and a brother that lived there. And I discovered a, I was introduced to a new cousin named John Denson, who was editor of the New York Herald Tribune. And uh, uh, I had lunch with him, and I told him about the speech of Galbraith, and I said, I, I took economics, but uh, it uh, taught me that free market caused the, the failure, caused the Great Depression, and that's why we needed government regulation. Now, he says this. He said, I've got a, a close personal friend who wrote the best book that's ever been written by Henry Hazlitt, and John had been editor of Newsweek, and he had hired Hazlitt and Walter Lippmann to uh, give uh, different viewpoints. So economics in one lesson started me off. And then I got to the Ayn Rand group, 
And they were recommending Henry Hazlitt and Mises. And that's how I got to Mises. And then through Mises, I got to the Foundation of Economic Education, FEE. And the thing that really got me into the military history was an organization called Ramparts College in sounded like Galt's Gulch in Colorado. And they had uh, university uh, programs much like the Mises Institute. You'd go there for a week or two weeks, and they'd bring in speakers. They brought in Murray Rothbard. They brought in uh, uh, Mises himself, taught there. And they had these um, tapes on a whole book on history. And if I recall correctly, the first military uh, history I read on revisionism was by Percy Greaves. And um, he uh, had been hired after Pearl after the end of World War II to invent, to do the research for the Republicans on Pearl Harbor. It had been a fixed thing to blame the uh, commanders. Roosevelt created this uh, commission to see how the commanders messed up, pr um, prohibited any investigation of um, what we were going on in Washington. So <clears throat> he, uh, he gave this speech that the thing was provoked uh, by Roosevelt's actions. And it just blew my mind. I thought, my gosh, why have I never heard this before? And uh, so then I went back and got some of the other history courses at Ramparts, and that introduced me to the what I would say the golden age of, of revisionism was the, uh, after World War I. Uh, Harry Elmer Barnes and uh, uh, Charles Tansel and Charles Beard just did a devastating uh, attack on why America should not have been in World War I. And why World War I was a, was a horrible thing. And it just blew my mind. I said, why have I never been taught this in college? I took history. I took history that taught me that the Civil War was uh, for the purpose of abolishing slavery. And World War I was for the purpose of setting up the League of Nations and ending all war. And Americans uh, destroyed that by not adopting. And World War II was to wipe out the world threat of Hitler. And, and you know, <laughs> I just uh, began to say, you know, uh, this is a whole new world. And uh, so military revisionism, war revisionism is a very, very important subject. And the theme of my book, A Century of War, is that I think it is the key to future peace. If people begin to learn the truth about why we go to war and, uh, and learn what the true effects of it are and how horrible it is, that things are hidden from the uh, most American people about the horror of war because they didn't drop atomic bombs on us. They didn't bomb all the cities, you know, like they did in Germany and Japan. So I think revisionism, especially as to war, is a, a key element for the future of peace. Well, John, one of the things you say in the preface to your book, A Century of War, is that we tend to think of history as this static set of facts. But in truth, history is constantly being revealed to us because we don't always have accurate information from the time. And, and sometimes uh, what develops is that what we thought was the truth is not necessarily the truth. That's exactly right. Uh, I've told people, given this example, that much of history is like, a, say, you've got a, a trial, uh, two lawyers, you've got a murder. You've got one event, a murder. And you've got the prosecution is telling you, that uh, his was my interpretation, the man's guilty. You got the defense saying, no, he's innocent. And it goes to a jury verdict, and the jury decides for one way or the other. But it's the winning side that gets to tell the story. And, th and it may not be the truth. It may <laughs> uh, All jury verdicts are not exactly accurate, and you don't hear the other side. So that's the way history gets written, is the winners tell the, the, the results. And uh, that's why I think you've got so much... Uh, falsehood about the American Civil War, World War I, World War II from an American perspective. I mean, we want it and we got to justify it. But when you say the winners, you tend to mean the winning political class, right? The states involved. Yeah. And so yeah. perhaps, you know, a lot of what we know as history is actually false state propaganda of a sort. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, uh, there's an interesting quote in here from uh, well, the British history officially came out in 1926 and indicated Christmas truce was just a minor, an insignificant event. But there was during the House of Commons debate in March 31, 1930, and Sir, Ken, Sir H. Kingley Wood, a cabinet minister, uh, got up and made a speech, and he said uh, he had been in the trenches. Right. He said in the front trenches in Christmas 1914, and he said, I took part in what was well known at the time as a truce. We went over in front of the trenches and shook hands with many of our German enemies, a great number of people. Now I think we did something that was degrading or wrong and refusing to uh, 
to uh, stop. He said, the fact is, we did it. And I then came to the conclusion that I had held very firmly ever since that if we had been left to ourselves, there never would have been another shot fired. For a fortnight, the truce went on, and we were on the most friendly terms, and it was only the fact that we were being controlled by others that made it necessary for us to start trying to shoot one another again. And he blamed the resumption of the war on the, quote, the grip of the political system, which is bad, and, and, I, it, and I and others who were there at the time determined there and then never to rest until we had seen whether we could change it, end quote. And then it concludes, but we could not. Uh, there's, uh, there are people that, um, that thrive on war, the military-industrial complex. And one of the results of the World War I revisionism was uh, to show that the, uh, the people that do the armaments uh, and so make money off that um, help cause war. There are people that bankers that have an interest. Uh, J.P. Morgan had a big interest in America getting into World War I. And uh, he had helped finance the uh, British uh, Army. And um, that led to the passage of the Neutrality Acts, which tried to keep America out of future wars. And Roosevelt kept trying to knock that down. And um, uh, to me, I, the, um, the most revealing book uh, uh, about uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, in addition to Percy Reeves starting it, is the book Day of Deceit by uh, Robert Stennett. Because it shows that uh, the hearings that were held right after Pearl Harbor were um, contained much perjury. Witnesses were told, do not testify under oath that we broke the military code. We actually knew where the Japanese were and when they were going to attack in Washington. And they were told to lie about that. And they did under oath. And he found out all about that through the Freedom of Information Act. So there are people that are in control uh, and certain elites that make money out of war that... Uh, have great influence on uh, getting us into war, keeping us there. Well, it's interesting how so often it seems by the time the truth comes out, the perpetrators are long gone and we don't know whether they get their just desserts or not. Yeah. I mean, look at the Iraq war. I mean, everybody knows that it was a fabrication of, of the intelligence that said that there were weapons of uh, uh, mass destruction in Iraq. And uh, we now know that was a complete lie. And yet, who's, who's George W. Bush has not been held accountable? His advisors, uh, the uh, people that furnish false intelligence, nobody's held accountable for the errors that are made that kill thousands and thousands, even millions of people. Well, in fact, many of those same people are still appearing every night on CNN and Fox, etc. John, one last question for you. You wrote your book, A Century of War, obviously looking back about the 20th century and the tremendous horrors of World War I and World War II. Uh, are you hopeful about the 21st century, or do you think it will likewise be a century of total war? Well, I did a podcast with Lou Rockwell uh, where I... Uh, I quoted this uh, wounded soldier of World War II saying that we've got to think about war in a different way. He said, look, we've always had, we always had slavery. For thousands of years, it was accepted by everybody. We've always had war. But then 19th century comes along and slavery gets abolished. And uh, it was partly because of uh, looking back at the Declaration of Independence that uh, everybody had equal rights to life and liberty. And uh, the Industrial Revolution came along. So there was a big change in circumstance and viewpoint, and only war that was fought that even in the name of slavery was, was uh, America. So there was a big change. He says, now let's look at war in a different way. And the big change that has occurred is nuclear weapons. Uh, we've got to see what nuclear weapons can do. We've got the ability to destroy Western civilization or even all life. We've got enough weapons now. So it's time to start thinking about war the way people saw that you needed to change about slavery. And uh, so I think we've got a chance because uh, if, if people realize the ultimate threat of nuclear war, then they've got to realize you can't just commit suicide. You've got to uh, take another look. So, you know, I think it's a possibility. And uh, uh, this, the Internet allows people to get past the... Uh, the barriers that have prevented uh, knowledge in the past. Uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, one of its purposes was to keep uh, from having revisionism after Roosevelt um, mm -hmm. uh, in World War II, the way that they uh, <laughs> revealed all the problems about uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson and so forth. So I think that the truth can be there, and, and there is a change in circumstance. War is no longer 
where, you know, when the Civil War started, people went out in their carriages uh, to get on the hill so they could see the battle. And uh, it didn't involve the civilians, they thought. And I read recently where there were 50,000 civilians in the South uh, murdered and killed in the Civil War. And uh, you look at the bombing of Germany and Japan, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, we didn't see that. And those people have been through it. So it's a, it's a different kind of war now. Well, John Denson, thank you so much for your time and for a great interview and for everything you do in writing for the cause of peace. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope you had a great and wonderful Christmas, and we hope that you take some hopeful thought forward with you when we think about the Christmas truce now 100 years later. Have a great weekend.